policy analysis, a second in sociology, and a PhD in administration and policy analysis. Uh, her area of research is in the social context of education. Uh, she's looked at the impact of desegregation and choice on families, schools, and neighborhoods, and she's looked at the impact of private school markets and demographic trends on voucher policy. Her most recent book with Ellen Goldring on Harvard Education Press addressed desegregation. It was from the courtroom to the classroom, the shifting landscape of school districts and desegregation. Her research has received a lot of attention. Uh, she's received funding from the William T. Grant Foundation, the U.S. Department of Education, the Spencer Foundation, the Danforth Foundation. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, uh, in the Washington Post, on CBS 60 Minutes, and other national media outlets such as the USA Today. She has an impressive publication record. She has published in some of the top journals in education research, educational evaluation and policy analysis, Teacher's College Record, uh, the American Journal of Education. So we're very pleased to have you here as a scholar, Claire. We're Thank particularly you. interested in your expertise around the professional doctorate in education. Claire is a professor at Vanderbilt Peabody College, and she has worked on the redesign of their EDE program, which offers a professional doctorate for those preparing for careers in practice in K-12 school leadership and higher education. Their program is nationally known for its innovation. And when I called my colleagues, Ellen Goldring and Joe Murphy at Vanderbilt and asked them some questions about their program, they said, you have to talk to Claire. <laughs> so we're very pleased that you agreed to come and speak with us today. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Mm. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Roger. Um, I feel like I better get back to work and <laughs> continue some of that, those lines. Um, it's really a distinct um, privilege and honor to be um, here at The Ohio State University. It's my first trip um, to Columbus and I can't tell you how much, um, or I can tell you how much I'm enjoying uh, my interactions and conversations with your incredible faculty and staff. And I look forward to conversations with students as well. Perhaps we can carve out a little bit of time because I'd love to get your perspective um, your interests and, and your concerns um, as well documented. Um, so I want to, yeah, I'm going to chat with you today about the um, EDD program and we can, we can also um, cross fertilize that conversation with a discussion of the PhD and how um, Peabody has made each program distinctive and separate um, over the last uh, seven or eight years. Um, it's been a process. I would um, suggest that it's ongoing. It's a work in progress. Um, and we'll talk about the, the pieces that I think are still sort of um, a work in progress and, and fluctuating and require um, continuous attention and refinement. And I think the pieces that we, we feel like we've nailed pretty well um, at this point. But I'm really open to your and, and look forward to your questions, um, your, your um, specific probes and areas of um, debate. Um, so so we, I'm, I'm, ha I'm gonna be really candid throughout this whole thing and share with you some of the warts, some of the um, challenges that we have encountered um, as we've moved through this process. So I wanna start with this really cool, uh, I do think it's pretty cool, uh, video um, that was, this is such an odd set of circumstances. We have this Grammy Award winning videographer at Peabody. I actually do not know the, still to this day, I don't know the circumstances of his arrival or his continued residence at Peabody College. Um, all I know is that he is extremely well known in his field. He's um, very much an artist. Um, he has a whole array of gold Emmys in his, I know, in his office. Um, he helped me pick out my video camera for a gift for my husband three years ago. Um, <laughs> So he'll do that, and then he, I was interviewed by the local uh, PBS um, group in Nashville, and they, they were sitting with me and they said, um, we understand that Robert is here um, on, your, uh, on your staff. Do you know how prominent he is and how many Emmy Awards he has won? And I said, I know I've seen them. Um, and they said, that's just incredible. So I don't know why he's with us, but we're so, so pleased and privileged. And he produced this video, and it did win an award. Um, it, it won a, a little um, Emmy Award. So um, I will begin. Uh, 
I, I get up very early on Friday mornings. I take Fridays off because I have to catch a pretty early morning flight. Leave from Charlotte, come into Nashville. Fly out of DCA or BWI. I'm real fortunate because there's so many flights that I can usually get out about midday. I will fly in Friday afternoon. Catch a flight to Nashville and take a cab. Sometimes I get a chance to check into a hotel first. And that gives me an opportunity to kind of get settled and class starts around four o'clock. It's putting the theories, the concepts, the legal opinions to play in practice because that's what you're about, right? So the EDD program is designed for working professionals um, on the weekends while they're pursuing their, their full-time work. People leave their work behind and are really present in the moment of what's happening in the class. Um, I like that I get to leave my life in DC and be here and, and be able to focus. And think and talk about ideas that are so important to their practice. So part of this weekend is deeply philosophical, it's historical, it's sociological, and it's based in, in some studies of political science as well. The Peabody EDD is designed explicitly to bridge this divide that has plagued education doctorates for decades. We bridge this divide between theory and practice. And what mechanisms can you put in place to support that? And our faculty in the EDD program believe that that integration of theory and practice is best achieved by working with professionals that are in the field. But that, and that goes to reliability. So I feel like it's an ongoing, constant dialogue. It's not one-way learning. I think we're all learning together. Um, the cohort model has been phenomenal. Probably the richest part of this experience has been going through it with a group of equally committed intelligent, fun people. Prior higher education has been really incremental with change. You know, there's folks who are uh, teaching in the classroom, there's folks who are superintendents. From independent schools, charter schools, public schools. They've almost all uh, taken on leadership roles in higher education. They're deans, they're associate deans, they're directors of admissions. Um, assistant superintendents, principals. That makes for an incredibly rich experience. One way to know whether a I've developed a much bigger professional network. I've also gained a bunch of friends. We eat together when we're here. We talk together all the time. We communicate when we're not even all together on campus. And we really support one another. That has made it uh, possible to get through this kind of program. It's a lot of work. Um, people need to know that. The work is, is, is difficult sometimes. It's been exhausting. And there is a lot of it. <sighs> um, lots of reading, lots of writing. And discuss and think uh, every part of the way. This is not a sit and get or just another credential. Um, it's actually about uh, uh, changing how you think about uh, what you do. Our district assembles cadres of expert teachers. I enjoy the intellectual rigor, I'm doing that thinking together with, with my cohort members. And I think that's where the cohort um, comes in and really helps support. So we make sure that each person has what they need to get the work done. Again, it's, it's exhausting, but it's been totally worth it. Uh, uh, it's changed the way I look at education, it's changed the way I practice education, uh, and will undoubtedly change uh, my future in the field. So we have moved from the classical dissertation, the old model, to a new model. It's called the capstone. Um, it's an applied project in which Vanderbilt partners with external educational organizations. We call them clients. They are school district. They are institutions of higher education. They are municipalities. All of them, though, share a commonality, and that is some problem, some challenge related to um, operating a successful school. The capstone what gave us the opportunity to identify real-world problems that we would be interested in researching. And we talked to students, we talked to faculty and staff, we uh, ran a whole data analysis to understand the problem. We, we looked at survey results um, based off of teacher feedback in selected schools and then we also went to visit the schools. And I think that one makes you as a doctoral student feel valued because your work's being valued by a district in real time. Help an institution, an organization, or a department um, with a real problem that could be applicable anywhere in the country. 
And so the best part about the program was this capstone where we got a chance to actually put into practice what we were learning in the classroom. And uh, there is a great deal of satisfaction knowing that my, the final product of this capstone experience isn't going to sit on a shelf somewhere. It's going to be, uh, has the potential to really make a difference in the lives of, of teachers and, and students. So how does that argument resonate to you? The classroom experience was very dynamic. Okay. How are those differences mediated? And they put some pretty amazing faculty in front of us who took us very seriously. So which of those two things do you really want to focus on? We are encouraged to treat them as peers and to even challenge what they say and to challenge the, the scholars that we're studying. And in mentors, as they would push me to really develop my thinking and at the same time offering a really personalized level of support. Very few of these students need a ton of advice on how to do their job day to day. Most of them are actually really good at their day to day job. What they really need to understand is the context in which they're working. How did we get here? And they always made sure that what you learned was applicable to what you were doing at that time. Professional development and formative evaluation of student teachers. But I had no idea that every class that I've been in, I'd be doing research that, that I take home or that I talk to colleagues about on Monday morning. Um, so that's been a surprise, a, a good one. Is it worth it? Ask our graduates. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It was absolutely worth it. Yes, definitely. I don't think I would have this job if I didn't have a doctorate from Vanderbilt. This was an amazing opportunity for me. This has expanded my career more quickly than I thought it would. You know, the fact that it's the number one education school makes a big difference. But the fact that you are learning from the nation's experts. That's really the beauty of it. So if you were really committed to being a school teacher or school principal, this will enhance that position. If you're really in love suddenly with policy and you want to move to the state level, this will enhance that, that career path. I would absolutely recommend it. It is not easy, but if you want the best, you need to be the best, and Vanderbilt is the place for that. Uh, the bottom line is this is the best program in the country. It's been totally worth it for both my career and for my own personal growth. And uh, it's, I'll make the trip. <laughs> I don't know that we're the best at all. So I think we're good and I think we're striving to be the best. So I want to add a little disclaimer um, there um, and, and then talk, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about that, but um, okay. So this is just we're, this is a short, shorter PowerPoint, and then I have a longer one, two different files. So this is just an overview of how we thought about differentiating the EDD from the PhD. And we started with, with this, this um, sort of visual that I think is, is taken really from Boyer. And this notion, it, it connects to our notion of a scholar practitioner with a knowledge base, a content base. Um, exposure to a whole set of explicit leadership skills, toolkit, if you will, and then as, as one of the students said, understanding context, and that's demographic contexts, that's organizational context, um, political context, policy context, et cetera. All of that is anchored to this um, pedagogical model of cases and uh, problems of practice, the cases that are reflective of problems of practice in real time, in real space. That's where we think the new generation of leaders is um, moving toward. So these are some of the major features of this EDD as we moved um, to really differentiate. Now let me say, back in the um, early 2000s, this, the two programs sat right on top of each other. They were indistinguishable, um, except for one fact, you were PhD in, in your files and an EDD in the others. Um, the PhD students took courses with the EDDs on the weekends, we've always been a weekend system for the EDDs, but the, there were lots of PhDs in there. And those EDDs who were local would come into a class at, from four to seven um, during the week. The only, they were both expected to do dissertations, okay? So very little um, uh, differences, articulated differences. And we found that not to be a good thing, we found that to be a bad thing. That we were not probably serving either group well or effectively. Now that's our, that was our thought, that was our opinion. I'm not saying that that's totally that that's universal, that that's a, um, 
uh, you know, a commandment, uh, that that's just a universal rule of uh, action. I'm just saying that that's what we found, that the two programs sitting on top of each other um, did a poor job of serving either group well or uh, effectively. So this is what we do now. Um, I put the National Advisory Board there at the bottom as a possible addition. This was an idea of a former department chair. We never moved on it. Um, I think there's some value to thinking about a National Advisory Board. We have yet to um, develop that piece. Um, we'll talk about each of these as we move forward. Okay, there's our target audience, and you heard um, that um, expressed a little bit in the video. So it's pretty broad. We're throwing out a big net out there, and we want it to be um, diverse. And we're going um, the entire continent. Um, we used to be much more of a regional um, program, um, big in the Atlanta, um, I think, metro area. We were pulling from there, pulling from Alabama, and of course from the uh, Middle Tennessee area. But now we have a much larger national focus, and that is supported, as I've been talking to several groups about this, with a marketing and outreach campaign. So we have benefited from a budget, a marketing budget that is ample. And then um, capacity is not only money, but it's staff. And we had a director for external relations, Dr. Tim Caboni, who finished his PhD in our program and then moved right into the dean's office. And he had a head for this stuff. And he, he developed this marketing strategy that is now in place. And it's all ready to go. And it targets professional associations and their mailing lists and sends them emails and also paper and goes to their we attend their conferences, and then it goes to the um, publications. So Ed Week, and Chronicle of Higher Ed, and Peabody Journal of Education, New York Times, Washington to Post. Somebody said to me last night they can't, they can't escape the Peabody um, advertisement. I didn't know it was that extensive. They said they even found it on the airplane. Is that right, Dean? <laughs> Sorry for that. That's a little bit too, uh, like, ah, can't we? So um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's an amazing thing. We did nothing before. And now we have this, this over the last six, six years, I'd say, built this infrastructure, this capacity to reach everybody wherever they are. And it, and it goes this broadly. It even goes international. We have some, we had a student who flew from South Korea. Can you believe it? Flew? Yes, <laughs> exactly. So there's our, our group, um, and they do come from all over. Here's a little bit, I like this side by side. Um, comparison of the EDD and PhD. What stands out for you there? What are some key pieces or anything that you want to talk more about? You're not, might, maybe not sure what I'm talking about. And does that look familiar to kind of what you've read about in terms of ways to distinguish, not necessarily the way, but a way to distinguish the two um, programs? And how did we do this? We sat around the faculty, set, we talked to students, um, we talked to people in the field, we talked to a lot of superintendents, um, and um, faculty sat around. There was just a lot of, of consensus, uh, one for the need to change, and then kind of the direction to go. Not, not to say we didn't have some disagreements, some, some really productive um, discussions that um, highlighted um, disparate views, but I think uh, we, we all settled around this. So at the same, so what I want to underscore is while we were differentiating the two, we were building up um, and clarifying the PhD and the EDD, both simultaneously, okay? And I think we continued this work. We continue today with this work. Here's a little bit, in, in, I call this admi some administrative differences, but there's your GRE. PhD is post-bachelor and bachelor's or bachelor science. So a lot of the, our PhD students are right out of undergrad for better or for worse. <laughs> I worry about that, um, and we can talk about that at some point, but they are 22-year-olds, many, and they're coming right in. Um, they have really high GRE scores, but they have no experience. Um, and they're guaranteed five years of funding at this point in time. 1,200 GRE, I'll just say a, a bit about that. That is not something that as a department or as a faculty we determined. That came from higher up. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and it was, we were told that would be our, our cutoff. And what we do is, uh, of course, it's an individualized, holistic review of every applicant. And if we feel that there's a compelling case, which there many are, uh, of a who has just a little bit below that, say 1,100, uh, we can go to the dean and we can make a case. And we can say, you know, these are the other pieces. 
This is the, look at this compelling essay, look at this record of professional experience, look at the academic rigor from their two prior institutions, their undergraduate degree and their master's degree. We think this student is going to contribute to the cohort and we think that they can be very successful. And what do you say? I'd say we win about 50% of those, those cases and those arguments, okay? which I think is fair. That, that's where we are. And the weekend format. So it's always been a weekend format. That's huge. That's a huge thing to get your head around. So it's not the four to seven. Most of our PhD students take one to four or four to seven. Well, actually, there's a morning of all the methods classes. I guess you have to have that mind in the morning for um, a lot of the quantitative courses. Of course, I'm a qualitative person, so I'm sleeping, sleeping in. Um, <laughs> and um, so, um, which are great three-hour blocks for the PhD students, the youngsters, as I call um, The weekend format seems to really work for our students, as you saw. They do fly in from all over. Some do drive in. We still do get a big, a big group from the um, sort of the Atlanta Metroplex, the Charlotte area, which is so interesting to me. Um, but uh, increasing numbers fly in, which I just can't even imagine that. Um, and uh, the hours are, they fit within the required out contact hours. Um, supposedly or formally, it is uh, 4 o'clock to 9 o'clock on Fridays and 8 until 6 on Saturday. So that gets you your hours and three times through the semester. So three, each class meets three weekends throughout the semester and students take two classes. So they are on campus a total of six weekends each semester and the EDD is nine semesters, continuous nine semesters, starting in the summer. Okay, I'll say a little bit more about some of the specifics later. There's your sort of typical, but they're really, you know, it's, it's highly variable. But uh, as you heard in the video, those are some of the kinds of the background profiles or current, current occupational roles or positions <laughs> when they enter. And you know, we were talking about this early, in many cases, after they finish their degree, you can knock off the assistant. So they become the principal, the, the director, um, the dean, when they had a, formerly an assistant role. Or the teacher becomes um, the principal. Okay, this is a lot on this, on the, a lot of text on this slide, which I, I try to avoid, but. Uh, participants should possess, you know, these are, this is what we're looking for. So the writing skills, the ability to work in, uh, on a team, to co-construct a project, because I think that's real world. Um, important to understand both the um, political frames of a particular problem, the human relations frame. We provide um, some deep um, knowledge around budgeting and finance, learning theory, those are our planks. Politics, economics, learning theory, and sociology, which is sort of human relations, I guess, there. And in a good evaluation class at the end. And I can, you guys can get a copy of this, so you can, if you want, to look at those a little more slowly. This is how we appraise uh, student performance and progress through the um, program. So of course we have traditional course grading. You must earn um, at least a B average in your methods courses. Sometimes that's a problem. That, I will tell you, that becomes a, a discussion. Um, that is often the subject of a faculty meeting with the student. Um, it does not look like you're gonna make that. Um, we, we see that, or if we see that early enough, we can provide some supports, of course, some tutoring um, in one of the courses, but that's big. Um, there are four methods courses and you, they must earn a B average and that is sometimes um, uh, tenuous, looking, <laughs> looking that that can be threatened by a low score, a C, a C grade, which in graduate school really is not acceptable. Um, they do, uh, we have a written comp exam at the end of the second year. It's about mastery synthesis and application. So we, con we continue this application um, emphasis in our EDD comp exam, just as it's emphasized in the program throughout. Um, taking knowledge, um, taking a problem and applying it. 
um, to a problem of practice, a case study to a problem of practice. Um, it's a take home comp exam um, that has been very contentious. I will tell you, among faculty, we've had really good battles about that. So I was on the take home side, and somebody else was on the, no, it should be a sit down, especially for methods, sit down, uh, demonstration of mastery, particularly. And we have decided to move back to, to a take home. We think that is better fits, again, these students, their, polit their uh, career pathways, and their preparation, what we've done in, in this class, in these set, sets of classes. And then the capstone project. Should there be an annual performance review, like we do for the PhD students? We sit down every spring, we review, all of us, a group of 12 of us, I think, sit down, we review student by student. We bring in some food because it takes a long time and it can be very uncomfortable sometimes. And these are students who are fully funded. They cost a lot of money, as I know yours do too, and we love you, um, but you, you are very costly. Uh, to the institution and so if you're not making adequate progress and you took a seat by the way and you're taking in a lot of money that somebody else didn't get so we do that for the PhD students and we counsel some students out of the program early as early as possible well should we be doing that for the EDDs we don't I told you earlier it seems we wait for that bad grade or poor performance in the methods and I think this is we, we should probably be moving to this there are always signs after the first year. Remember, these, these students too start in the summer, so by the end of the spring, we have three semesters worth of coursework. We have six classes that we can evaluate. So I think we, though it takes so much time, I think this is really important um, for the integrity of the program, and uh, you know, it's, a, it's an ethical issue too for the, the student, because why keep the student, if they're not going to be successful, why, why keep accepting their money? Um, why keep them enrolled? It's not fair to them. They may do really well in another, another um, doctoral program. Um, it's also nice to, to tell lots of students, the vast, vast, vast majority, almost all probably, that they're doing really well. So an, aff an affirm affirming of their um, high performance would be nice too. I'm going to talk about the capstone experience. I think this is actually the last slide of this. Um, but just to give you um, just a heads up here, it's definitely constructed. Um, to be consistent with the course, the co course content, it's problem-based, and we're gonna, I'm going to talk about these clients, we call these folks clients. These are the, um, the, the source of the request for assistance. So I think that's it on that. And if I push escape, then I will get down to this and close this out up here. See, I'm a Mac person. This is just kind of slippery. Oops, and then pull up the other one which would be up here. <coughs> and then go, oh, F5. Okay, very good. The Ohio State University. <laughs> I love that. Of course, we love Eddie George. We're your former, okay. <laughs> he is such a nice man, too. We saw him Christmas shopping last year. Um, very nice guy. Okay, so this, I'm gonna talk about the coursework to this, the scaffolding, the framing, the research and application. So from coursework to capstone, we spent a lot of time as a faculty talking about that. We'll unpack the elements of the capstone. I'll talk about the lessons learned, again, being really candid about our mistakes. I will look at a couple of, well, you have some examples that we sent earlier. That was the scope of work, the um, seminar syllabus, et cetera, and then I'll talk about moving forward. And then, of course, your, good, your questions. So let's look at some of the EDD core courses. I think these line up pretty well with your um, courses. Tell me what you think of this list. So we, so we start with learning and instruction actually the very first summer. Remember they begin in the summer. Our EDDs begin in the summer. Uh, leadership theory and behavior follows. This is pretty close to actually the way it, it, it folds out um, in terms of core courses. So these are the core <laughs> courses. Let me explain this cohort. We take in about 25 students per year. 12 or so of those are in higher education leadership, and the other 12 or 13 or so are in K-12 leadership and policy. And they take these courses together. The higher ed EDDs, who come from you know, student affairs, admissions, financial aid, 
academic program, and the um, principals, assistant principals, assistant superintendents. They're all in these classes together. The bottom four are these, what we call the methods courses, or we, they're you know, decision analysis, because it really it's all about making good decisions, right? It's all about problems, addressing problems of practice. So we use that terminology here to be consistent. And I teach the quality, I teach de decision analysis three, and I teach the context of educational leadership and policy. Any, any questions? Does that flow, does, that overlays nicely with your course selection, I think, um, in many ways. Now here's the specialization classes, and I, I saw a lot of consistency here as well with your programming. And we've tinkered a little bit with these over, over time. Um, the diverse learners and at risk, that was not a, an original course in our redesign six years ago, seven years ago. We added that more recently. Comparative issues in education, that's the international piece. And I'll tell you, that has been a, I'm kind of neutral or even agnostic on, on that. But that one seems to be, we have some faculty who think that's really important, um, that this is, uh, education is a global um, topic and policy, and others who think that is, that should not be in our, in our list on the specialization, that there are other issues that should, should take its place. And you might think about that. I don't know how you feel. What's your position on international compare? I think it's important. Actually, maybe I'm not neutral <laughs> um, <laughs> as I think about it. So, um, and the politics, of course. And then we look at that name, resource allocation deployment. Who came up with that? That is fine. That's, that's school finance by another name. I think Jim Guthrie came up with that um, title. But um, you know what we mean. I think there's stuff missing. Right, this is not perfect. So you might map on, you might think about other stuff that we're missing here. What about the higher education students? Yes. Where's that difference from? Is that different list? That's a different list. Whoop. There you go. And take a look at that. Does that map on to yours? What's missing here? So I, I'm really open to you know your your diagnostic assessment here. And we've got comparative is issues there. And we have five um, tenure line uh, higher education faculty members. Again, we all teach in the EDD program. We all, almost all of us teach in the PhD program. I could only come up with, when I was thinking about this morning, only one professor I can think of who teaches in the PhD and does not teach in the EDD. So we are fully invested in both. We also teach undergraduate. We have a big undergraduate program at Peabody. Big, biggest major in the whole university is at Peabody. And we take the um, one big track of that HOD undergraduate major. We are all absolutely required, no questions asked, no exceptions. We are all required to teach in the undergraduate program. And we, I love it. They're an interesting group. <laughs> yes. Yes. And do they, are they like a cross line at all? So do they have to be published in the Very good question. And in yes. No, because they can't fit it into their schedule because of the way it yeah, plays out. That's a great question. This is locked in, no electives, no changes, questions. So you have to think about, you know, is that really the way to do it? Um, we decided it was because we decided this is the content knowledge we think our students need. And we want it sequenced this way, and we want them to have this, I call it playbook, um, for their interactions in their professional lives at the end. This is it. No, no choices. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right way to go. That's what we decided as a faculty. So you still run in with the cohort model. Yeah. Do you think life comes up for a student? Oh. Such a great question, and it does every year. <laughs> uh, yes, they have to wait. They, they just wait and come back. And that's typically what they're asking for anyway, so it's not a big yes. And life does always happen. Um, illness, change of job, divorce, um, those are the typical three. And um, almost every year that, and we'll, say, we'll, we'll assist that student, and they'll just come back and join the, the next cohort the next year. Yes. Uh, have you recruited faculty who can speak to both a K-12 context as well as a K-12 
grow the higher ed content. Mm, that's or really good. Have issues where that's really good. The person's teaching this, the students say, this person only gives examples from yes. elementary school. Yes, <laughs> yes. I work in higher education. Yeah. Perfect snapshot of, of a reoccurring challenge for all of us. So we've always taught leadership. Um, the social context class was something I've always taught since I joined the faculty. Right, but um, I don't really focus on higher education. I mean, in one, only in one domain when I'm talking about race um, and race policies. Too. So we had to embrace, we had to start thinking more deeply. So I walked across the hall, and at the time it was Jim Hearn, who's now at University of Georgia in higher education, and I said, help me, give me, some, and now I, now I talk to Stella Flores, as you may know her work real well, and, and so help me with some, some papers. I want to just season. Um, I want to integrate those works. Um, I think I'm only, I'm still, I'm still working on it, I would say. I know the higher ed people say, have said uh, from time to time, we get so much K-12 um, in, those, in those, because most of K-12, funny thing, most of K-12 faculty are the ones teaching those core courses. I don't, I'm not sure why that is so much, but um, so I would say that there's still a tilt a little bit toward K-12, and we're still working on it. Um, I will also tell you, though, that to some degree, and the higher ed faculty will back me up on this, John Braxton, Will Doyle, Stella, um, our, new, our two new faculty, hey, our higher ed faculty, stop whining. Um, you need to know this stuff. You need to know that you don't get an 18-year-old out, right out of, you know, at birth. Um, they, they actually have this whole school history when they arrive at your institution. How about that? And so you need to better understand those issues of academic preparation, of poverty, and how that has impacted this, this um, adolescence, this now young adult's progress or pathway toward higher education. Get over it. Um, I mean, I'm a little bit of that, but I've, tr I've, I've really, I've, I've used now, I use the Bowen book, if you want to look at this really great piece. And similarly, K-12 people, you need to understand where your folks are going, you know, and which pathways they're taking because of what you did, how you thought about these issues, how you thought about poverty and housing and other social policies, how you thought about the deployment of resources and school finance. So let's all get together around this. So I think I would tell you, you hit, hit it on the nail, that's a continuing challenge, and it's incumbent upon us to, to continue to do it better. But yeah, I think it, we are doing it, and we're, we're getting close. That's a great question. Okay. So we take this from Boyer, and this is, our, this is the, um, kind of the foundation, this, this thought, uh, this concept, um, this principle. Um, really informs our concept of the scholar practitioner. I don't think there's anything more important than, than the quest for this, um, and the quest of this goal. Okay, so the capstone, these are some highlights. So we send out a request for assistance, but we also now have a whole uh, Rolodex, to use a really old-fashioned term, of um, capstone clients. And these are school districts with whom we have worked in our own research. Um, they, they come sometimes recommended to us from, from colleagues at the University of Michigan or a colleague from mine at, at uh, UCLA might say, hey, I know this, this school district would love to, to work with you. I've been working with them there in Arizona. You know, contact them. Foundations, sometimes we're getting our recommendations for potential capstone clients from our own students. But here's the thing, you cannot work on a capstone involving your own school district. No way, no how. Now that doesn't mean we might work with a school district. You, as a, you just can't work on that capstone. You'll select a different capstone. That came up this past year. Um, we have uh, really good relationships with Jefferson County Public Schools. That's Louisville, Kentucky. A really good relationship with our own school district. That's Metro Nashville Public Schools. Big school districts, urban school districts. Now we have a thriving relationship with Jonesboro, Arkansas. And, it's, and, and four um, contiguous school districts, and that's rural. So that's giving us a really good opportunity to delve deeply into some rural education context policies and um, programs. Okay, this was big. It's a team project. So you can, you, you can work on a team, and that team is comprised, you must work on, with a, uh, on a capstone with a team. It's either two people or three people. That's it. No exceptions, two or three, okay? 
Um, I actually originally envisioned this as single authored pieces, and I was overruled um, by my faculty, who said, no, we think this mimics more precisely, uh, more relevantly, the real world. Um, I will tell you, I think there was also a practical side to this, in that it means fewer capstone, pro yeah, like, oh. fewer capstone projects, less work, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I will, I mean, that was down here. The real, really, really big impetus for this was, no, this is, the, this is what they've been doing. This reflects what they will do, always do. Um, you know, faculty, we're kind of weird in, the, in that many of us work autonomously or individually in our offices. Um, I, I work mostly alone, actually, but I don't think that's, that's typical in the world of practice. So I think this, this idea of teamwork, this co-construction of a, a problem identification and product is, is really parallel, fits nicely with their real life. Oh, yeah, boom, big, big issue. Well, big issue up front, and it has turned out not to be such a problem. So we have, um, we, we tap into that, and we send a um, report of effort to every student three times over the course of the capstone. The capstone is 10 months. It's a 10-month process. They get their capstone. They select their capstone project in May or June, and they finish it in, in the following May. Well, that's graduation. They really finish it, they really finish it in, in March or April. That's why I say it's 10 months. So we're dipping in and we're asking the students privately to report on the individual effort of every team member, including themselves. That, that will raise, we hope, flags. If we see a flag, we call that student in and we talk to that student. So Karen, you know, we, we've gotten evidence that you're not pulling your weight. Um, two of your mates have reported that we need to talk this through. Okay. Um, Turns out that has, there has only been an issue one time. And, and we, we can make it a, you know, it's not a, obviously you're going to know that the two of us have reported, you know. So, but you already know that you're not pulling your weight, so it's not a surprise. We've had one incident where there were two members of the team. This person I was concerned about anyway, and he turned out to, to prove me right. And he was not pulling his weight. Um, the other person came to me, reported it with some documentation. We ended up in that case separating them. I identified a robust capstone at the same site for this person and for this person, and they finished individual capstones. We felt that was a good solution to that problem. I will tell you that there's such a, I, I hate this, this sounds like too good to be true, but there is an esprit de corps that develops among these, these students this, the, because they've worked together, they play together, they struggle together. By the time at the end of their second year that they have embraced this capstone, they know with whom they want to work. Karen's a good, good teammate. I definitely don't want to work with Tom because he has let me down before in the past. Um, so they know with whom they want to work, and they've already pretty much deleted those uh, uh, any other candidates. Um, that becomes a real driving force in, the, in terms of the capstone team selection. So I think we've done a pretty good job of emphasizing teamwork has to be shared and equal, and you're going to be found out. No one's going to want to work with you. That's probably the biggest, hey, we, we, we actually can sit back because the process just unfolds and corrects it, self-correcting behavior. Nor, the, norms are so, the norms are so strong to be a good partner. Yeah, TK. Yeah. Well, I think we get that through our, um, we, dis we meet with, I meet with my teams, with my groups monthly. When they're coming in for a class, I'm carving out some time on Friday and we're talking about their scope of work. Now we're talking about their surveys. Now we're talking about their um, data collection. The specific tool that you're talking about, problem solving, I guess I should have already discerned that ability earlier on. I mean, this is a culminating product. This is the, the, the topper, right? So if, if I've identified some weaknesses there, I should have, and my other faculty mates, should have identified that problem 
of, not, of a lack of problem solving and those analytical skills earlier on and addressed those. The comprehensive exam is a helpful diagnostic for us there as well. So I'm not so much focusing on that. In, I'm, I mean, I'm aware of that, but I'm, I'm really looking at shared effort. Everybody's in on the interview pr uh, protocol development. Everybody's collecting data. Everybody has an analytical focus, et cetera, et cetera. As part of the scope of work, they have to outline uh, activity and lead lead team member, activity and lead. So that's developing the interview protocol. There'll be a lead team. That doesn't mean everybody must be contributing to that, but there's a lead team member. IRB, IRB turns out to be, of course, one of the first challenges. Everybody's like, yeah. Um, you know, repeated. That usually takes three efforts, three submissions. Somebody takes the lead on, on IRB. He or she consults with the team members, but that person, that makes sense. That's, that's efficient. Does that answer? Okay. Okay. Okay, so to um, again highlight and, and, and punctuate the point, what is the purpose of this capstone? It's right here. Why do we do it again? Because we think this is consistent with adult learning in a professional program and it's ethical, ethically responsible. Let me go back to that. Adult learning piece, okay? We teach learning theory, that's our first class. Well, we better start practicing it, right? So we said this capstone should adhere and reflect the principles of learning theory, particularly adult learning theory, active learning, problem-based, content and method combined, contextual and that contextual understanding piece, et cetera. You guys know learn, adult learning theory. Boom, you better capture and reflect that in this culminating project. Adult learning theory or learning theory writ large, okay? Then it's a professional degree. So we looked at medicine and we looked at law and we said, what's professional learning all about? Okay, if we want to amplify and underscore those principles, then it should be problem-based, problem-focused, problems of practice. Okay? That's what these folks are going to be doing. They are not going to assume, not for the most part, I mean, we have about 8% who do land academic jobs and do do some, mostly they're in teaching, in, uh, institutions of higher learning that emphasize teaching. They do very low research. We're not training them. That's not what they want to do. As Murphy says, don't train them for the job that they have not selected. Why would we be training them to do that kind of work, a PhD sort of oriented work? That's not what they're doing. Otherwise, they'd be in the PhD program. They want to do ED, EDD work. So let's train them better at doing that. So that's what we think we're, we're focusing here. Um, the ethical imperative was this. We have too many students. This was really true my first 10 years at, at Peabody. We had all these students going to work every day after investing tens of thousands of dollars in an EDD only to never finish, only to be ABD. It does nothing for them, nothing. They'd spent tens of thousands of dollars and we were sort of sitting back, well, sorry, whatever. Sorry you didn't finish. Sorry you didn't do a lousy dissertation, like most of them were. Do you know how many, let's be honest, do you know how many studies of the female principle? I mean, how many can you do? The female principle in rural Arkansas, the female principle in urban Philadelphia, the female principle 50 ages, years older. I mean, it just went on and on, the female principles. I, as though this was really new, too. Um, I couldn't believe it. And everybody wanted to study their own school as though that had some validity. I'm sorry if I'm in, well, I shouldn't say that. I didn't mean to offend anybody. Because uh, it can be good, really, really good and strong. But um, everybody wanted to, to shadow, you know, to, they wanted to shadow their colleague. I'll do that for three months and then write it up and that will be my, my you know, EDD dissertation. So, and then just think about all the time spent in um, advising those EDD students. Uh, for what? So we took a hard look at that. Okay. Um, courses to capstone, yeah. And so this is really critical because if you have a curriculum that's disconnected from the capstone, then what are you doing? Um, you're failing your own test. So we really make sure that what we're doing within the courses. Now, I'll tell you, I do not visit every classroom. My colleagues, there's a lot of academic, you know, the, the, the precepts around academic freedom. Um, I don't, I haven't scrutinized every 
syllabus. Um, and I think for the most part, we are on the same page as far as uh, assigning products that reflect this scholar practitioner model, this problem-based learning using content, using theory, using the extant literature to inform problems of practice. But we're not all there yet because I will tell you that several of my colleagues, well, some of my colleagues still assign the 30-page research paper at the end of the course. That's it. That's your only assignment, the 30-page. Now, why, that does not, to me, fit within the EDD program at all. That can be certainly part of it. Review of the literature, absolutely. Demonstration of um, understanding, mastery, application of these theories, absolutely. But just this third, that's it? No, it should be applied. But some folks are still doing that singularly. Um, that's their, the basis of the grade. I don't, I don't think that is terribly helpful. I can get you these um, copies of uh, these syllabi. Okay, so this is the process of developing the capstone. So we can just walk through these steps. Um, and it, it's also a lesson learned, the initial meeting with the client. So these are school districts for the most part in K-12 and colleges and universities in higher education. Also systems. So one of our brilliant new clients is the National Association of independent schools, NAIS in Washington, D.C. They are dynamite. Dynam that sounds like they're bad. They're really terrific. They're <laughs> uh, explosive. And um, we worked with them two years ago, and now John Chubb has assumed the uh, presidency there, and he is super supportive of a continuing relationship. So we would, and also because we're getting increasing numbers of independent school leaders. I don't know if you are too, and I don't know what that's really about. But we used to get very few, and now we have 20% oh, of each cohort, two or three um, are independent school leaders, or, or heads, as they call themselves, heads, really interesting um, issues. So we've also had an association, a client, the Southern Association of Independent Schools, so a little bit more regional. Um, Tennessee Higher Education Commission, uh, Tennessee um, State Board of Education, um, those are some good examples. Okay, so the initial meeting with the client is to vet them, is to make sure that they understand a few things. Rigor, this is not a course assignment. This is a dissertation. It has to be huge. It has to be really deep. It has to be a meaty problem. And so I say that in that way because we had a client when the problem was more, was more clearly explicated, it was like something my students could do in a single semester. It was not a, a capstone, and I kept pushing him to get bigger and deeper and broader. So that was some, some consult, ongoing consulting. We had another client, so I'm just spilling all the, the dirty business here. We had another client who, after thinking this was a great idea, this collaboration, you know, they're getting sort of a consulting project. Well, it turned out they didn't really want to share much of their data, and they really didn't want to give us access to their teachers. Um, I was sharing this this afternoon. Um, they would give us some access for interviews with their teachers if we paid for substitute teachers while those teachers were out of the classroom. We don't have that money. I had never, you know, in my research, I've never been asked to do that. Um, we typically, as I said over and over to them, we'll schedule these interviews at the convenience of the, of the teacher. Before school, we're happy to be there at six, you know, whenever. After school, whatever, or during their planning period. Just tell us. But we're not, we don't have any, I mean, my dean would have gone ballistic. Are you kidding to pay for, I never even took it to her. Um, we don't have that money. We have money for travel, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the scope of work memo is the template. That's the blueprint. That's what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. That's a four to five page MOU, Memorandum of Understanding. That's big. Four to five, four to two five. <laughs> Yeah, that would be basically the capture. Right. Four, I should be more clear, four, two, five. Um, inside that has an, a, a design for a data collection. The interim reports are coming up tomorrow. So I'll fly back and fry, we've got pizza coming in and we're going to have, a, and I've invited um, the Humphrey Scholars. We have this ongoing, do you guys have Humphrey Scholars? Oh, they're so great. Yeah. They're from all of these education leaders from all over the globe. So I've had three auditing my classroom from El Salvador, um, the Philippines, and Tibet. 
and um, I've invited them to join. Say they work for the Ministry of Education or of the regional province, provincial education leaders. leaders. Uh, they're going to be part of our conversation tomorrow night. Um, John Braxton directs the higher education capstones. He'll meet with his group, and I'll meet with my group. We used to do it all together, but we think for at this point, for kind of focused feedback, it's best that we separate and do the pizza. And we'll go until about 8 o'clock tomorrow night, and then they're going to use all day Saturday to work in their war, what we call their war room. We're going to get designated space, whiteboard, you know, nice tables, and they're going to work in their teams all day Saturday, and then they'll fly home just like they were here for a class. They're going to fly home Saturday um, afternoon, early evening. They're going to get so much work done. And they're going to, I'm telling them, they're responsible for giving their um, colleagues, their cohort members, uh, feedback just as I am. Public presentation, the draft report is due in, as I said, it's in March. I'll give them comments. They'll revise and be ready to go in April. The public presentation at Vanderbilt is like this. So all faculty, all students are invited. Um, we get, we get um, EDDs who are rising Capstonians, so they're just in their second, they're in their second year, and we call them Capstonians, and have t-shirts, and then um, <laughs> magnets, and bump, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and it's great. Um, so the faculty are really involved, but I will tell you again, mistake corrected. We used to hold this on Saturday, in April, it's the very end of the semester, and a core group of us would attend, but not, not sufficient. So the department chair said, we gotta fix this. And so we moved it to, and we said, indeed. So we, have, we moved it to Friday, um, at Friday beginning in the morning. It goes, oh, so we go all day Friday instead of all day Saturday. And we have box lunches for everybody. And it's open to everyone. It's announced and it's open. It's really great. It's really a celebration. And everybody comes dressed professionally. Um, unlike my, my appearance in that video with my shirt hanging out. Um, okay, yes? Earlier, you had had a slide that said that the faculty members do the DC capstone project a couple of slides before this. Uh, faculty select supposed okay. Yes, okay, very good to, to help clarify that. So I select the menu. So I'm talking to the clients, and remember, I'm only doing the K-12 side. John Brack, Dr. John Braxton does the higher education side. Okay, so I'm selecting, I'm talking, um, I'll start doing that in February, start talking to the clients, clarifying which clients I want this, this coming year and projects. And so then I select, I have the menu and then all the clients come in on a Friday, typically at the end of May and present in person to the students. It's really, it's great. And that is such a commitment, you know, that just shows the superintendent from, from Louisville, um, or the director of research and evaluation all the way from Arkansas, they come to Peabody for the afternoon and present to the Capstone students. Is that not, that's cool. And, and we have food again. And um, the students then select the, from that menu. They rank order one through three. I typically have more Capstone projects than there are teams, so they get lots of choices. I have, um, in seven years, given every student either their first choice or their second choice, and I would say 80% of the time it's their first choice. Now that's what we were doing earlier on. They were, they were given the sheets. You guys rank order your top three choices and give them to me tomorrow. The next day. Think about it maybe overnight. And there, by the way, the students are on campus that Friday and that Saturday because they have a regularly scheduled summer class. Um, now, what is so funny to me is that they self-select their own groups. And so now on Saturday, I get an email bright and early typically, uh, hey, Dr. Smirker, we've selected our groups. And they've all formed their own little group, so I don't have to match them now at all. They have talked about, see, they're so close. They've talked about it. They've self-selected in or self-selected out, and they know with whom they want to work. And, they, and the projects all, you know, I, we, we pick projects that have typically you know, broad appeal, um, and it's boom, it's done. It's really great. And this uh, is the beer and wine group, not the whole band. Oh, yeah, oh, beer and wine, that's right. They do this, I think, over beer and pizza and wine at the, one of the local pubs. And they, that's what they tell me. And they all get together, and it's really um, convivial, and it's very much a reflection of this bond that they have, they have formed. I, I don't want to paint this as so rosy, but apparently this is what they tell me, that it's, it really works out, that they, it just all filters through. Yeah. 
It had even worked when we were rank ordering them. Uh, matching them, I should say. I think that's where we are, right? Yeah, okay, capstone product. Um, it's specified, all the components are specified in um, the syllabus for the seminar. Um, I will share this again. I know if I've already said this to some of you, but um, I'll never forget what, what my department chair at the time that we developed this said to me, Jim Guthrie. If this looks like a dissertation, we have utterly failed. I don't know, but that, that was his position. So, for example, we talked about this earlier, there's no chapter two lit review. There's no 35, 45, whatever, uh, chapter two lit review. Um, he said, if I see that, I'm, I'm going to throw up. That's not what we <laughs> should be doing. Now the counter. So at AERA three years ago, I did this presentation. And professor who directs their uh, EDD at uh, UC Berkeley, professor, met with me later. He loved this, but he said, that lit review, that's not going to fly. We have to have that lit review in our district. In our, and I said, well, that's fine. It's not, this isn't fixed. You can have the lit review wherever you want it. I'm just suggesting to you that this has a different emphasis. The literature, concepts, theories inform what? They inform the development of the instruments, the surveys, and the interview protocols. We almost always have mixed methods. The students have already taken, as you saw earlier, they've learned how to develop a survey and execute it and analyze it. They've learned how to develop an interview and conduct interviews and analyze the data. They've already done that in field studies, in real life and in real time. So we tell them that the research, obviously, should inform those instruments and those buckets. It should inform their analysis of their findings in the discussion section. And it should inform, obviously, their recommendations. Boom, three ways that the literature needs to be extant, needs to be explicated and informative, OK? Heck, if you want a lit review, put it in, put it there. It doesn't matter. We're just saying that the utility is different here. It should be explicit, the utility. OK. Presentation I've already talked about. I haven't talked about the uh, private um, conference or, or conversation. So the students typically present to their client right before they present to us on that Friday. They typically fly back or drive back to the university or college or to the district office and they present to a whole array from what I've, I've never sat in on one of these, but they are presenting to the superintendent and his, her, her whole cabinet and program directors and, and what, and you can imagine at higher ed because it's so administrative heavy. Um, all the administrators, when they're presenting at the college or university, they have a whole room full of program directors and administrators, really, really impressive group. So that's the public is VU faculty and private is with the client. And then a lot of our folks are now presenting at conferences, um, UCEA in particular. OK. And again, the application, of course, evaluative, uh, formative, and, house, and strategic. I think those are hallmarks of a good capstone product. These are things that I've sent to you, or you can um, click on links to the capstone projects themselves. Um, there's, a, there's a distillation of each section. I'll just let you take a look at that. And if you have a question, just let me know. Single space and typically in columns. So with, with embedded um, color graphs. So it looks like a consulting report and not a dissertation. Columns, yes. <laughs> about dissertations? I really like what you said about it being embedded into the, the capstone project itself. And I, I'm wondering if you could give us a, a little bit more of that. And there's a corollary question. And, and, and I'm assuming that the, that the presentation that is given to the client yeah. is not a research. Yeah, let me take that last piece. So we, um, and I have an email that I can share with you. So we tell them what to, ex what to present and what to expect in the VU and then the Vanderbilt faculty presentation with students, of course, and then it should be more 
tilt, it should be tilted toward the academic foundations, some of the research literature which inform this, the context, the demographic, organizational, policy, sociological, demographic context and policy context that gave rise to this problem identification. Um, that should lean heavily on that contextual por portrait or profile, then heavily on the way in which data were collected and analyzed and how they reached their recommendations, okay? How they reached it and what the recommendations are, but how, a lot of the process, okay? To check on rigor, to check on validity, reliability, et cetera. When they present to the clients, flip it. They should much more be about, a lot on the, t the context again, but uh, of course this is this, the client's own context, so they know that. But just setting up the um, profile of the problem and a lot on what the students learned in their data analysis and their recommendations. They spend most of the conversation on findings and recommendations when they meet with the clients. They have, the conversations I've heard go on for hours, like ours is, you know, they only get 30 minutes to present and 20 minutes of questions. I understand that when they're meeting with these groups, they go on for hours uh, talking about the recommendations, hashing them out, working. It almost becomes a working meeting with the superintendent, his or her cabinet, or the uh, college. It's, not always, it's usually the provost, I think, who meets with our students. Does that help? Okay. So there you go. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And as an attorney. No. I'm, well. I'm actually speaking as TK now. Okay. You can call me dirty later. The, 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 that final product. Yeah. And the issue of copyright. Right. Okay, let me go two ways on that. First, it's um, intellectual property, as you suggest. It's archived. It's our property. Um, it's in the e-archives. And they know that. They're told up front. So the clients are, this is, this is the way it will be um, produced. This is what you'll get. You'll get the full version, but it will also be available for public view in the e-archives. And so you can, now you, I could give you the link and you can pull up any capstone that, that our students have produced over the past seven years. But here's the issue of anonymity. So, okay, I'm gonna, this is gonna be for public view, then what about the anonymity issue or confidentiality issue? These are not confidential. Obviously, they're gonna be out, but we can create pseudonyms to protect the identity of the client and, and work toward that, that an anonymity goal. Now, I only know of a couple cases where the client has asked for anonymity, and I think they were colleges. They weren't my, any of the K-12 folks, any, which is kind of interesting and surprising in a way. But I guess they've suggest, they thought, well, if we're gonna do this, let's do it. And let's show them, you know, let's give them access to our, per, our personnel, to our teachers, our principals, give them access to all of our survey data, to our achievement data, which is protected, of course, by uh, non-identifying information. But um, we have not had a school district say, use, make sure you say it's in the southeastern United States, the locate, you know, in, in any kind of ways you can mask. We haven't had that. I know that some of the colleges and universities, though, have asked to use a uh, pseudonym which I think is very reasonable, and we're happy. But that's an upfront conversation. That's what are the conditions of this collaborative endeavor. So, so the end result is the called work product. Yeah. So the, the work product end result belongs to the university yes. and not to the client. That's in my understanding. Yes, that's my understanding. We don't, and I, because I, I've gone through that uh, process recently with a consulting uh, uh, arrangement I have on something very different than this. And um, we have not gone, we have not, we have assumed that this is the intellectual property, just like a dissertation would be. It's archived in the exact same way. That's a long process, that IP process. Or at least it did, it took us a long time. Um, so here are an illustrative list of some capstone clients. South Bend was a former doctoral student, earned his EDD, became superintendent, and asked us to come back, asked us to come up, I should say, to his district. He had a federal grant, too, so he was able to cover um, the students' travel to South Bend, Indiana. Um, Westside is also one of our former doctoral students, now graduated, and Buffalo was actually the um, uh, Rudy in the, in the video. He's now with Buffalo Public Schools in the Buffalo Promise neighborhood, and he asked us to come back, and that was just last year's um, project. 
So a lot of that, that's now becoming sort of a trend. Here are some boards, associations, and colleges with whom we've worked. That's really, you know, other than the DC and out, that's really kind of a Tennessee focused list. And here are topics. And this is kind of cool list. And we're almost done. <coughs> Do you see how they, they pretty much dovetail into sort of national topic areas, trends, uh, pressing problems of practice that have sort of broad application. We're often studying implementation patterns, some organizational change, impact for leader on, in, on leaders, etc. Yes, sir. Both, yeah, formative, and so that's where we're, I'm checking in regularly with my team, and, and John is t t uh, touching base with his, uh, on progress and scope, that scope of work, and are they adhering to that scope of work. I will um, always uh, review and provide feedback on the interview protocol, on the survey, on their, whom they're going to interview, how many interviews, how many surveys, which survey, are they using SurveyMonkey or some other, um, we, meet, we meet, as I said, periodically. Then this interim report tomorrow is huge um, because I'm going to hear what they've now, in sum, what they've done, um, what they've collected, and their next steps. And I'm going to give them, I'm going to just assault them with lots and lots of feedback. So that's the, the um, formative. And the summative comes in March when they submit to me their drafts, and it will have a lot of red on it afterwards. So I'm, you, typically the problems are not, not identifying the problem. They've, they've done that. It's often more um, structural, like this section really needs to go over here, and you didn't clearly specify this, this concept over here, and there's a lot of editing that's required, and then I might say, and this whole piece is missing, so you need to add. So that's the, what I would call then almost the summative, typically the summit of my evaluation of their work. Um, when they present to the Vander Vanderbilt faculty, I've signed off on it at that point. They have made the changes and, and resubmitted it. Uh, what about, uh, I, I told my question earlier. Oh, sorry. Uh, with respect to the substance of the report, the capstone that they're presenting to the client or to you, are they doing a formative evaluation of some program oh, in the school system? Are they, okay. Are so they we're, doing a summative In their, okay, okay, very good question. I'm sorry I didn't, yeah, I missed that. So first of all, only a fraction of these are actual evaluations. I would say they are more of a um, analysis of an ongoing program implementation. Um, it's not a, it's not a, so it's not a distinct pro, it's a, it's a new curriculum, it's a freshman academy, it's a um, teacher evaluation system that has come down from the state. Um, they are not evaluate, evaluating really the success of this program as much as what's happening in the field. How are people responding? What organizational changes seem to be taking place as a result of this? So a fraction of them are program evaluations, but the vast majority of them are an analysis of something ongoing, and they're really looking at implementation patterns and strategies. Um, for the higher education, a lot of it is persistence. What factors are impacting persistence in this college? What is the role of organized Greek societies? What is the role of um, counseling services? What is the relative role and importance of, um, well, relative role of extracurricular um, programs? A lot of persistence issues um, in higher education. So um, they are never summative, never summative evaluations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're getting much uh, teachers who are evaluating the teacher evaluation models. Are we getting enough study on value added? No, because these students don't have the um, quantitative skills. They have not taken Dale Ballou's um, class, um, which is at, at least his second regression, and HLM, and propensity score, and all that. They have not walked that. 
uh, pathway, the PhDs have, so they don't have that skill set. Um, what they are doing is they're interviewing teachers and principals on how these evaluations are being conducted, what is the impact on um, practice, um, how are the politics of these evaluation systems taking hold and, and maybe um, redirecting the actual implementation. It's much more contextual and descriptive. Descriptive rather than value, yeah. Yet. Yeah. Very interested. Uh. Yes, yes, it is, exactly, exactly. And so to the first part of your question, I would say it's, you know, it's, it's depth and breadth differences. Um, we, we proceed on this premise that the PhD students are going into a world where research is their number one activity um, and responsibility. And the EDDs are going into a world of practice where research will be consumed, applied, critiqued, utilized in some way to inform practice. We argue that those EDD students, nevertheless, need to know how to design and conduct research using both quantitative and qualitative skills. So we do that in those, in those classes, okay? We do that, we, we run them through design, data collection, and out. they learn how to do that, but they learn you know, at, at this level, right? At a good level that allows them, we think, to better understand when they read a piece, and we do this, they critique qualitative pieces, and they, and on their, they do it in our classes, and they do it for their comp exam. So they, have to, they need to know standard errors, regression co uh, coefficient, what all that means, okay? So that when they read a piece on the um, you know, outcomes of a new reading program, they, they understand what that article is asserting and can critique its methods, reliability, all of that. But the, the PhD students are deeply immersed. So it's two different skills. Oh, it's completely different. It's tailored to the different Exactly. It's two different instructor, it's two different faculty members. Yeah. No, it's Dale Ballou. <laughs> uh, no, he teaches the PhD. Do you know Dale? Yeah, yeah whoo. Um, so he teaches PhD. I mean, it's, it's, students are scared of that, you know, speech. And then Will Doyle, Will Doyle teaches the survey, and, and Goldring teaches the introduction of that. And of course, they do that work too, but Baloo, no, it's completely different texts, completely different assignments. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the comp exam is at the end of the second year, and it's a check. It's a check-in point that they have satisfied to our um, degree, of, to a high degree of confidence, a mastery of an understanding of quantitative um, data collection, design, data collection analysis, qualitative design, uh, social, all of those required courses, and then a specialization. So they sit and and, or excuse me, now they take home. Um, questions that test the mastery of that knowledge and their ability to apply it across all the courses that they have completed at the end of their second year. Because remember in their third year, half of their time is spent on their capstone and the other half is completing just two more classes. Lesson learned. We used to, to um, enroll them in two classes in the fall of their final third year and two classes in their spring of their final year. The students were dying, um, and and they couldn't they couldn't satisfy to our they couldn't complete to our satisfaction really the scope of these capstones. So we crossed out those t uh, those two classes. So the I don't remember. Oh yes. Oh yes. Takes on the sort of the basics, and then who, who do you do the We do. We the EDD faculty in our fields. So I read all the EDD questions on social context, and uh, Goldring rings all the quantitative, um, the question on quantitative methods, et cetera. There are, I think, there are three sections to our comp exam. It's core, specialty, and methods. 
And you know what, let me back up. I think, I think we're still doing the methods question. I'm, I, I, I think it's still in class. I think they still have to do the methods question in class. And they take home the other, the specialization. And they have 10 days, I think, to complete it. It's, a, it's two weekends, because we figure they're working. So they have two weekends to finish the comp exam at home. Specialization. Yeah. Okay, I think we're just about, oh, more illustrative pro topics. Oh, this was, this one is, I think I shared this. This is for um, NAIS, the economic impact, the recession um, impact on um, independent private school operations. And that was really good. I mean, they're all, they've all been solid. That one is, I think, really e exceptional. Um, yeah, so lessons learned. So uh, make sure you've clarified with your client the scope of, these, of this capstone, that you have a under, clear understanding of the access that you will need, your students will need to data and to personnel in order to do a full analysis of this problem. We assume the cost burden of travel. We have a, uh, I just asked about this before I flew up here. Apparently we have a budget of about $15,000 um, for travel to the actual sites um, for our, these um, capstone teams. They typically make at least two, sometimes three visits of about two to three days each. Okay, so say that again. two to three visits of two to three days each um, from their homes wherever those are, they're all over, to the um, capstone sites. We try to be really frugal with them. This is actually, I was just looking at an email, and there's a little problem that just came up yesterday. So again, because this is not yet, this is not perfect, we've had a little problem with some students going over budget. Um, we tried to tell them that really you should use Nashville as the, you know, the cost, the figure from Nashville, uh, stay in a hotel together, well, not everybody, but by gender, you know, and uh, or try to stay with a friend, draw, everything you would expect. We try to keep those costs down. We are on a little ledge here, trying to hold on to that fifteen thousand dollar travel budget. Fifteen thousand per cohort or per per cohort. Yes. So is it the higher end of twelve? Yes. Per cohort or one cohort? We think of them as one cohort. So fifteen thousand for about twenty five people. Yes, but let's do it by 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 co by capstone teams. It's typically seven seven teams at any one time, right? Seven, so it's about two grand a piece. They get between two and three grand a piece. Uh, some of them don't draw down any funds because they might be, so when we work from Metro Nashville, they do all their data collection when they're here in conjunction with a course. So, and sometimes we get really, you know, we're not even incurring any cost. Sometimes we are. Or we get like a Buffalo or that South Bend. Both in those cases, Buffalo paid, for this, the team to travel, and as I said, South Bend paid for the team to travel, okay? But that's, yeah, and so we have to tell them, shared rooms, you know, minute, we gotta keep this at a minimum. I think that's, that's, it's been working very well, and actually the secretary who sent me an email this morning said, this has not been a chronic problem, but this is a problem today, and we need to address it with one team who kind of went crazy. Um, had a really nice dinner <laughs> in St. Louis. Missouri, wow, um, restaurant I would love to go to. So, um, <laughs> um, project scope, we've really kind of um, walked um, through that. Oh, well, yeah, because, so, um, oh, let me say, yeah, so the rigor was a client who didn't understand this need to be rigorous. Recommendations, a uh, team said to me uh, early on, well, we couldn't recommend that because we knew that it would, um, it would anger the client or it would create some kind of angst with the client. I said, no, 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 you need to make those recommendations tied to your data. A client can accept or reject your recommendations. They do that every day with paid consultants. You're not even getting paid. So you make your recommendations and they can like it uh, or they can reject it. And we, I was telling the group earlier today, we had a presentation to a particular school district made last two years ago, and one person, a high-ranking school district official, at the end of the presentation stood up and said, I think that's a bunch of crap, and I hope that your report ends up in the 
in a box in the basement. Apparently, she tied it all together. She said, in a box in the basement of our building, never to see the light of day. And she walked out of the room. So she's rejecting the recommendations and that findings and recommendation. And that's fine. That's fine. So let's have a discussion about it. But they need, my students have now been told, I say this at the very beginning when they get their um, capstones, you make the recommendations that flow from your data, from your analysis, and let the chips fall. Um, and I'll stand behind you always. That time in the field is important, um, and students need to structure their leave, their professional time, however it works, with their place of employment. They have to work that out. We don't work that out for them. They need to have a clear idea that they're going to spend, as I just said, probably three trips and two to three days each. So they need to think about that and make um, also family um, obligations need to be adjusted during that time. I've already talked about the way in which we reduced the course load. We also resequenced some of the classes. We moved the um, evaluation class to the summer in which they're beginning their work on the um, capstone. It used to happen too late. Um, and it's, it's, we want them to know about program evaluation, but we tell them repeatedly, this is not necessarily a program evaluation. The professor who now teaches program evaluation, Mimi Ingle, is just fantastic. She now takes the capstones and she, whenever relevant, she'll talk about issues related to program evaluation and how they relate or don't relate necessarily to the specifics of this capstone process and product. So that's what we've learned. We dropped some classes and we resequenced some others. Oh, this is what we're studying right now. This is the final. Um, slide and this is what we're beginning to put together in a paper of what we're learning from a series of interviews conducted 90 EDD graduates and capstone clients um, so that we can refine um, the process and the um, uh, courses and the, the scaffolding that gives rise to this, this capstone. Process outcomes and product outcomes and, the, and we want to, apparently there are no disconnect, the, the students are very positive about the process and the product. That learning to work in a team, uh, creating these complementary skill sets, and linking the course concepts to the problems of practice in real time pays big dividends to these students. And you saw that, I think, in the video. This is the last. That's it. Any other, any questions I can, additional questions I can answer? Two minutes is time. Yes, we're over time. I'm thank so, you. thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.